Good morning, y'all. How is everyone? So we must have a lot of people uh, out of town or uh, I hope they're out of bed. I know we have some people who are sick, <laughs> but if you're joining us by live stream, welcome. And we're so glad that you're here. And yes, Chris is right. We were in Dallas this weekend and uh, got in about 1 a.m. <clears throat> and it was just a, a powerful time, you know, because it always is when people come together in unity. You've got you've got everybody in the room there for the same thing. The reason conferences can sometimes be so much more revved up is because honestly, I'm going to be frank with you, okay? People have paid to come there. They have put their faith and their money into going and having something change in their lives. And they're there and they're focused. They really want to be there. So, uh, you know, like Stephanie was explaining with the the concerts and how worship or there it's just singing and dancing or whatever, but how that bodily response happens to that music should happen to the, you have the bodily response to the music in the house of God. I'm going to challenge you to do the same thing with the releasing of the word of God and the preaching of the word of God. As we divide his word, I want you to pretend like you saved up and paid to be here. Okay, or you can just come and lay a bunch of money here and I'll figure out something to do with it in the ministry community, okay? Uh, but as you are expectant, that is when the Lord can move. That's how it works. All right, I want to talk to you this morning about your mind. And it's really interesting to me. I, I didn't know you were going to have that word about mindsets. Uh, or I, we didn't know that the Lord was going to uh, talk to us about mindsets. But it is about the mind. So I'm going to send the ram first thing. And so get your phones out, and we're just going to start by uh, saying this together, and it really is going to allow us to set the, the stage, and honestly, it's going to set the stage of your heart. It's going to prepare your heart. It's just a really simple one today, and you can stand and read it with me if you would. This is repeat after me, day 63, if you're at home or anywhere and you do not subscribe yet, just Use the QR code on your screen and sign up, all right? You get these daily. All right, read it with me. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. That's Psalm 26.2. Amen? All right, you can be seated. What you just prayed right there, what you just, whether you say it or pray it, the Word of God, it is living and active. It is, it is living and active. It is a two-edged sword. So it divides between the bone and marrow, the soul and the spirit. So the words you just spoke over yourself are working right now. They're working right now. God is about to examine your heart. He's going to help, he's gonna help you to as you are tried, right? He's going to try you, test me, examine your heart and your mind. So there may be some things that you think today that you've never thunk before, <laughs> but just give it a chance and say, hmm, maybe that's because I just prayed that over myself and I've asked God to test and uh, try me, examine my heart and my mind. So I am going to be talking you, to you today about your mind, specifically about, because we've been talking about for a couple of months now, deceptions, right? And how the mindsets of the world can really just creep in. And before you know it, you are believing things that are contrary to the Word of God. But you're doing it like this. You're, you're doing it as in, you know, well, that feels right. It seems right that love is love. That sounds harmless enough, right? So you just think, you, you fall into the, pat, the pattern, the mindset of what the world is saying about a topic. You've got to open God's Word, His love letter to you, <laughs> and you've got to make sure that it lines up with what He has said is going to be good for your life. Because the Bible is not a book of rules, okay? There are some restrictions in there, but it's, it's really not restrictions, it's protection. God wants to protect you. Amen? Anybody with me? He wants to protect you. He wants your life to be full. He's got a plan for it. It's actually different than mine. You have one of your own that is so very, it is so very unique. 
So he's going to have to make you and get your, get your mind synced up with his to where you are walking in step with the spirit. That includes your feelings. That's what gets us every time. Well, I feel, I felt, y'all, I'm a feeler. Trust me, ain't nobody got more emotions than me. And I, I married the most steady man uh, and, and patient man because I'm, I'm very emotional. And, uh, I mean, I, I cry at everything. I cry when I'm sad. I cry when I'm mad. I cry when I'm in love. I cry when I'm happy. I cry at beautiful architecture. I cry at poetry. I cry at everything. And there is only one waterproof mascara I've ever found that it'll last about 20 minutes, but I can outcry it. And, uh, and eventually I've got little dribbles on my face. So, you know, if you're a crier, if you're a feeler, then I want to just challenge you, and I'm talking to me today too, to not just be governed how you feel. Okay? How you feel. Do you say that a lot? How you, how, well, I feel, well, I just felt... So the title of my sermon today is the F word, because I am frankly, not frankly, not that F word, uh, or the other way F word, I am, I am honestly trying to watch how much I say this, uh, because it can get me in trouble a lot. And, and if you're a feeler, you just kind of think you got a blank check from God. Well, I'm feeling this. This must be the Spirit. No, it may not be the holiest Spirit, <laughs> you know. So we need to make sure that our feelings are in check. So Thursday morning, uh, we were going to be leaving, I guess it was that day, maybe, so maybe it was Wednesday. But anyway, Wednesday or Thursday, we were getting ready for leave for Dallas, uh, and I woke up to an interesting dream, and it, it was kind of silly. It's going to seem silly, but you'll understand it in a moment. In it, I saw all this jewelry tangled up. How many of you ever traveled and your jewelry gets tangled up? Anybody but me? Okay. So I see all of this jewelry and it is so tangled up. I don't know. Hannah, do any of your chains ever get messed up? You're trying to work with them and you, and some of yours are like really delicate. So I can't imagine how those just get tangled up if they're not stored properly. And so I'm in this vision and I'm, I'm not only trying to get these pieces of jewelry undone, but I'm, they are, there's something like honey or syrup or something underneath of them, and they are stuck to the drawer they're in, and so I'm like peeling it up and trying to untangle it, and it was just a mess. So I go to pack, and I realize that from when we, whenever we shoot, uh, for my show, we shoot like a couple of dozen episodes, and if you've got if you're shooting 24 episodes, that's 24 changes of clothes, 24 changes of jewelry. And it, you know, because people notice if you're just wearing the same thing every time. Uh, and I was going to do that. And Chris was like, no, you cannot wear that. You wore that. Da, 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 da. So amazingly, somehow he keeps up with these things and he'll say, go buy a new shirt. So um, I was unaware that the last time we'd done that, I had not, I had not reorganized my jewelry and gotten it out of that container. And when I opened it up, there were 13 necklaces, long necklaces, 10 bracelets, and countless earrings all mangled up to get. No honey, no syrup. Okay, thank goodness. But, uh, but it took me, guys, a couple of hours. And I'm untangling and just did it. And, and if I'm spending that long doing anything... I just say, Lord, what does this what does this mean? Why am I having to spend my time doing this? Sometimes it doesn't even take two minutes. You know, why did this happen? Why was this delayed? Why did on our way to uh, Dallas, why did we get delayed? Uh, the flight was on time and all of that, but we get in the air and, and Chris tells Dawn and I, she went and ran our merch table uh, and did a phenomenal job. We had triple the sales we had last year, uh, where she had done a phenomenal job then, you know, but we had Mama Donna at home this time praying, I guess. So we're in the air, and Chris tells us, or I said, what kind of rental car did we get for these nine bags of merchandise? And so we're like carrying, pushing one, carrying one, and have something strapped to the back or on this. It was comical. 
And he said, oh, I got a pickup truck. And I said, what? Like, the, what if it rains and all of this product is in the back? And he said, no, 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 no. I checked the weather. Don't worry. And it was like $200 cheaper to get a pickup truck, and it's a four-door, and the three of us will be very comfortable, and we'll have all this room in the back, and won't have to cram them in a trunk. And I went, okay. All of a sudden, the pilot comes on, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, we have plenty of gas, but we're going to have to circle in the air. There's bad weather in Dallas. And, and listen, they'll fly through thunderstorms. I knew something else was up. <laughs> and... So we touched down almost like actually a little more than an hour late and we find out that one of our bags, we get all, you know, the eight are there. Where's the other bag? Where's the ninth bag? And it is, turns out we went to Dallas and that little bag went to Chicago. And so, so we're having to wait. We're thinking, what, we're going to have to wait till this flight gets in from Chicago to get this bag because I'm not driving all the way back to the Dallas airport for this merchandise. I called Jillian, who had packed all the bags, and said, what was in the small or the medium silver suitcase? And she told me, and it was all the signs for the product table. If you're going to lose one bag, that was not the one to lose. And so because, though, that our flight was delayed... We're standing there with the other eight bags, and right as we're inquiring about the ninth one, here comes the flight from Chicago in, and there all that luggage. So we were, because we were delayed, we were able to grab the bag, go straight to our destination, and not have to drive all the way back to the Dallas airport later. I get to the conference. We're late for dinner. I walk in, and, and people are in line. All, there's maybe, I don't know, at the dinner, it was just a dinner for leaders. So it was maybe, I don't know, 60, 75 people there. And we literally, we're at the very end of the line. Very end. And I was so tired and da da da. Got like three hours sleep. And so, um, so I'm, you know, we're, gonna, we're standing there with our plates. And, or no, actually, we walked in to try to find a seat, and Cindy Jacobs comes running up to me. I didn't know where you were. Come here. Oh, oh, come here. Let's go through the back way and get you your food right now in the kitchen. I was like, there's a parable about this. You know, you're on the back row, and somebody asks you to come up and sit at the banquet. And so uh, she takes us, and we get our food, and she said, did you hear there was a tornado at my house today? I said, What? She said, it wasn't even forecast. I said, I know. There was not supposed to be any rain today. And we never experienced any, did we? There was never any rain. It wasn't anything like that. And, and she said, um, and they actually showed a video of it at the conference. She said, we're sitting there getting ready for the conference. And we look in the back of our yard, and there is a, there is a funnel formation forming. Twister. And then she says, all of a sudden, we see our heavy stucco concrete huge wall that divides their yard from the neighbors huge chunk of it comes up off the ground and they see it go and plop into their pool and of course she says and the lord started talking to me about the winds of change and i'm like cindy your house is falling apart but she was so excited and you know insurance will cover it or whatever but so mike gets up and shows us the video all the leaders, the video, I guess it wasn't on the live stream. And I'm thinking, Lord, did you, like the whole delay thing, we were by this point saying, thank you for delaying the plane. Thank you for the weather. You're the weatherman. And because of that, we actually arrived at the same time as the Chicago bag, got our little ninth bag. So however you look at that, you need to remember that sometimes the things that happen to you that are delays and you're like, oh, why did it happen, or why did it did? Trust me, I'm the one in the group that's going to be doing that. So you've heard, while the pessimist and the optimist were arguing over if the glass was half full or half empty, and the realist, who is me, is arguing over how on earth they're ever going to get water on the scene, period, the opportunist drinks the glass of water, okay? So I'm the realist. I'm always going, but what are we going to do? How are we going to drive all the way back here? I always want to find a plan. I'm the, I'm the plan gal. If you got a problem, I'm the troubleshooter. We're going to get out of this pickle. 
so I need to keep my mouth shut sometimes and just let all that happen internally and not give you the play-by-play. -play. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so I just want to challenge you that there are times when you are going to experience delays or whatever it is in life, and you have to monitor your feelings, and you have to check them and say, Lord, did you do this? Why? Maybe you did this. And Dawn is so good at that. While I'm sitting there being the realist, she's, and, and you're being the optimist, you know, she, she's over here just praying in the spirit and going, thank you, Lord, there's a reason you did this. Thank you, Lord, there's a reason you did this. <laughs> you know? And so you just have to, with your feelings, always keep them in check. I think I've, I've proved my point. So with your feelings <clears throat> and with the vision or the dream that I had about the jewelry, I started as I got them all untangled and I'm down to like these final two. The Lord starts answering my question about what all this means because I knew I was going to speak to these ladies because they're ladies about part of this topic and your feelings. And they're all prophetic at this conference. There was, I don't know, maybe a thousand people. I don't know how many people were there, but listen, I had a bunch of feelers in the room. I was going to talk to them about their feelings and checking them, making sure we have to be people of integrity uh, in, you know, in the prophetic community. And so, so as I'm thinking about that and I get everything untangled and I'm realizing, you know, the Holy Spirit saying to me, this is a picture. I didn't just give you this dream so you clear a couple of hours because you're going to have to actually do this today with all of your jewelry before you repack it better. But because this is a picture of what happens in your emotions, what happens with your feelings. Really, you know, in your relationships, you get tangled up with other people. Um, you give your heart to them. It's, it's actually easier to get hurt. Right? I mean, does the, does the bag boy at Kroger hurt you? When he doesn't pack your groceries right, he better not. You need to grow up if it's that bad. Uh, but the people that we love the most have the potential to hurt us the most. So in this entanglement that you sometimes feel, and your emotions, and it's all just messed up and you want to avoid people, I'm thinking, well, good. This is, this is good. I got them all entangled. I made sense of this. This is what you have to do in life. But there were these two, two necklaces that I could not separate. And the chains, and here's why, the chains were identical in color. They were both the same shade gold, the same size link, the clasp was identical, and they were wound around each other all the way up to the clasps, and the clasps were just hanging, hanging their heads like this, but they were, they were all just wound up together. I had to work for probably 30 minutes on that one. Uh, at some point, you're thinking, how much did I pay for this? Can I just break it, throw it away? <laughs> like, I'm really tired of sitting here. And the Lord spoke to me again. And he said, Laura, the people that bother you the most in your life are just like you. The people that you cannot stand their responses their reactions. You know, sometimes it's good to get delayed and have to just sit and think about something or nothing while you're doing a mindless activity like that. And he's, he started bringing these faces in front of me of people that I'm so much like and, and how often we do this. Well, we love each other, so there's not like any blowouts, but it's, you know, you get in the car and you're like, mm. And the Lord starts showing me faces, and I was like, I mean, I, we could be identical twins, personalities, you know, so if we survive each other, this is going to be really powerful, the things that we can do together. And so I just want to challenge you to look at the relationships in your life and the, and the people that, that maybe you have uh, the most, and, and, and it's, again, I shouldn't say the word personality. It's not that your personality is just like these people, but maybe it's your habits or your outlooks, or maybe you say, no, 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 that person drives me crazy. They are nothing like me. If they would just be like me, that's the issue. You're both prideful. So I'm saying just look deeply, look deeply at that boss or that spouse or that child or the parent or your neighbor, whomever it is, if they really, really, you know, 
get on your last nerve, then they may be somebody that you need to look at, you're tangled up with for a reason because God wants to teach you something about yourself. I've always said that my uh, three daughters are, they're so different, they're so different. But they are, interestingly enough, each one of them just like me in some way. So you've probably heard me say it before, uh, my eldest, Jessica, I've always said she is my mind because we think a lot alike, not in everything, but I'm saying the process of like how quickly we do things, get things done, can organize, like it's all just very, we, we, I say she's my mind. Jessica is my mind, okay? I say that Georgie is my heart because we feel things exactly the same way. If I need a child to come and pray with me for four hours and fast for four days, Georgie's like, oh, yes, Mama, I'd love to do that. Like, she is always full, uh, fully in, fully there, in the moment. She is my heart. She's my heart. Genesis is my mouth. Genesis is the one. Where's Genesis? Where's your hand? In the back. Genesis You're my heart, I mean my uh, mouth, and you know this, I've had this conversation with you before. So Genesis and I speak a lot alike. We have the same personality, we have the same delivery, like she'll handle emails for me, she, with customers, not with you guys, but um, she she just knows how I would respond, and and so because of that, you know, I, it wasn't until child number six, and how, determined she was. She was so determined, so persistent, so full of the best idea in the room, and we can do it this way, and this will work better, and she's smiling the whole time she's doing it, but I'm like, ah, she's just like me. And it wasn't until she was probably 10 years old or so, so by this point, we had been married almost 30 years, 25 years, and I came to you and I said, do I do these things to you? And I mean, without a hesitation, he went, yeah. I said, I am so sorry. I was able to see in Genesis the strengths, and and, and I know my own heart, I know what my motives are when I'm like that, so I know hers. And you all know her, and you know there's nothing wrong with the way that she communicates. But I'm saying that when we're together, we have, and when we work together, we work really well together. But it's because we respect each other, and we have to remember, okay, both of us are being equally as determined right now with this idea or this graphic or whatever it is we're trying to come up with for the business. And sometimes I just have to remember, God had me hire her. She's got the anointing to do that graphic, not me. Just nod and say yes. And I mean, what she does is so good, but you all have seen it online, that that's easy to do. But what I love about my relationship with Genesis is that we are, our lives are all tangled up together. But we are, even though we're so much alike, I see the differences. I see the things in her that I respect, that I wish I could do for myself, that I wish I could be myself. I see those same things in Jessica. Jessica just lets stuff roll off her back. She has always been that way. She'll just, you know, get worked up, and then she'll be like, oh, well, that's enough on that. And then she'll just go on to the next thing. And I just really stay there and have to hash it out in my mind and, you know, all the rest. And so I learn from each of my daughters. Georgie is very, very forgiving, very merciful, slow to anger, slow to speak. So do you see... They're all three like me in some way, but all three of them have things that I need and that I respect and wish I could incorporate into my life and then do. But those those ones that you're just like, those are the ones that you have to be the most careful with. So I'm up to the clasp. I'm up almost to the end. And there's just this couple of little knots, and I'm trying to figure out which clasp belongs to which necklace. And the Lord says, Laura, go look up clasp in Hebrew. And I was like, Lord, I'm a little busy, just a minute. <laughs> you know? So I have to lay it down exactly like you got it stretched out. And I go and look it up. And it's merely a Hebrew word. I think I've got it here for you, don't I? 
Kabach. Do I have that? Yeah, Kabach. And it means to embrace, to clasp, to embrace. And I thought, what a beautiful picture if we could get along with the people that rub us the wrong way the most, that sometimes we have, we share characteristics with, even if they're internal ones or mode of operations or whatever it is. Why do you butt heads with the people that you do? Why do they stir up these feelings in you? Why are there so many church divisions and splits? Why is it that there's a high job turnover rate in certain industries where you really have to work closely together with people? It's because of this very thing. The people that we're tangled up with the most, when you feel those feelings of entanglement, decide instead you're going to embrace each other. It reminded me of Isaiah 40, 31. You know, those who mount up with, excuse me, those who wait, this is the most important part, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, shall mount up with wings of eagles. Did I actually have it there? Great. Uh, they will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. That first sentence, those who wait on the Lord, that word wait doesn't mean, Lord, I'm being so patient. Look at me down here. Haven't complained all morning. It actually is a Hebrew word, kava, and it means to bind together. There's, there's so many different things that it, it means. I've got a slew of definitions here on it, but most of them are the same, to wait, to look for, to hope, wait expectantly. So there are those time elements in the word, but more than anything, it means to bind together. So it's, it's those who bind together with the Lord Those who get tangled up with Jesus, they are the ones that are going to renew their strength. So he's talking to me about all of this and and being bound together in the body of Christ and being tangled up together. And, And then he just started, again, talking to me about feelings. And this was this was the sticky part, I think. And he started showing me how, uh, if I can just be real with y'all for a minute, he just started talking to me about how forceful I am. I was even reminded about uh, with our leaders a couple of weeks ago, or gosh, it was probably only last Saturday, um, that I shared the story of of the afternoon that you came in and you just were undone. You were, we had been through about, by that point, maybe, six, seven years of uh, hardship and financial struggle, and you as the breadwinner were just taking it the hardest out of all of us, and why can't I provide for my family? (laughs) I'm not doing all these little odd jobs. Why is my calling, my destiny, my purpose in life not showing up? You know, why did you have me leave all of that, Lord, all that job, the corporate world, and all that? And he comes in one day, and um, actually we were on the phone, and he hung up on me. And I don't know that you have ever done that, ever. Uh, I mean, I can count the times on maybe two fingers. So I knew something was really wrong. I tried to call him back, wouldn't answer. And I just, I, I, I was like, what is wrong with him? And uh, so hours go by. I cannot find him anywhere. Nobody knows where he is. Didn't do that either. And all of a sudden, I hear the door. I'm standing at the sink. You, most of you have been in my home, and you know where my kitchen sink is. I'm standing there doing dishes. I hear the door close behind me. I start drying off my hands. Before I could even get that done and turn around, he walks in the kitchen door behind me by the fridge, and he literally collapses on me. He collapses on me. And I, you know, I make my way down the down the cabinets with him, and I'm trying to hang on to him and get on the floor, and he is just sobbing. He's just sobbing. And then I thought, okay, we can't lay here in a puddle, so I I try to get him up, and we, we walk, we get into the bedroom, and he lays down on the bed, and he curls up in a fetal position, and he... He's murmuring, I don't know who I am. I don't know who I am. I don't know who I am. Maybe a better wife 
would have gone over and held him. Or, or thank you. Or maybe, maybe a kinder person, you know, would have just been like, oh, honey, I know it's been so rough. I'm so sorry. You're doing so great, you know. No, I went over and pounced on top of him and turned him over and got my knees in his chest. And I said, yes, you do. You are Christopher Lee Smith. You know who you are. You just don't know what you're doing right now. But you know who you are. And then I started telling him who he was with his finger. So someone I love very dearly spoke into my life, you know, last week and, and just said, uh, I want to know that my feelings matter, not just that everything that happens is warfare or the devil influencing me or whatever. I just want to know that my feelings matter to you. And recounted a story of, of something similar to that that I had done one time, and I was screaming scripture over them, and, and I thought, I remember the story a little bit differently, but just, just listen. Just listen. And as I listened... And again, remember, all of this is flashing through my mind while I've got jewelry in my hand and I'm trying to get this untangled and I'm realizing that this person who said this to me is just like me in that way. And so even though they remembered some of the details wrong, and I, did, I do remember moments of kindness in that encounter, I thought, okay, Laura, so maybe in the middle of trying to get rid of the devil for people or remind them of who they are. I mean, it worked that day. I don't think that you were angry at me or anything for doing that. I remember it having good fruit, but we need to be mindful of the feelings of others. I need you to hear this morning that as you, as we minister to each other, we need to, yes, be aware of what's going on in the spirit realm, but our feelings are very important. And what I did this last week and what I did on the plane from Dallas to Nashville last night was I tried to figure out in the word of God why we have feelings to begin with why he even did that we have them for a reason they're beautiful they're wonderful we are made in the image of God do you all know that he has feelings do you know that you have feelings because he has feelings do you know your feelings are important because his feelings are important so I'll get to those verses that I found in just a minute. I want to share with you something, actually, that I learned from Skylar recently. And that is that when the serpent came to Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he, he plays on her emotions, right? You know, ah, I eat this fruit. No, we can't eat that fruit. Why? Oh, well, we'll die. He says to her, Surely you will not die. God knows when you eat it, you'll be like him. And she thinks, right, in her thinker, in her feeler, that'd be a good idea. I want to be like God. I want to be like God. Don't you want to be like God? Not like God, but you want to look like God. And you want to have his attributes. So it gets all tangled up in her emotions and her feelings, and she makes the decision to go with her wisdom instead of God's wisdom. But the interesting thing about that phrase, the exact phrase that he uses with her, you will not surely die. That is a Hebrew word. Die is a Hebrew word, muth. It's M-U-T, but it's muth. And that is a interesting little caveat there because... The word right before it, surely, is also the Hebrew word muth. So what he's saying to her is, you will not die, die. And it, that's interesting because uh, I did the same thing in Dallas this last, uh, well, I guess it was probably two days ago. We had some food left over, and I said to, the, to uh, Dawn and Chris, I said, well, let's take it home. Not home home, but home to the hotel. So what the enemy was doing here is he was saying, you won't die, die. And she didn't. She didn't eat it and drop dead. Did she? Aha. 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 So she, she receives these words. She sees them as truth. Feels good, right? Follow your heart. Sounds good. Duh. But it went against the word of God. 
And so in that, in that place, in that moment, and we've all reached it before, sometimes with a little patience, those who wait upon the Lord, sometimes if, you'll just, if you can't make a decision and you don't know what to do, just bind yourself to him. Wait on the Lord. Just stick there <laughs> until you have your answer and you've dug into the word of God to get some direction for it. So I, I loved that when you showed that to me, Skylar, because I, I have chewed on that for a couple of weeks, how often the enemy will do that to us. He'll take something, because he knows what's on the other side of it for you if you obey God's word. He knows if you will just stay on course, if you will just do what he has asked you to do, or maybe those in spiritual authority over you who pray for you are speaking into your life. If, if He knows if you do that, it is trouble for him. It is bad news for him. And he's always going to mix it, therefore, with a little bit of truth. She didn't drop dead right then. So, it's where our feelings get involved. And this seems right that often gets us into the most trouble. So, why did God give feelings to us if they can get us in so much trouble? I've already established that we are made in his image, so we are going to have to have feelings. There's just no other way uh, around it. But pure and simple, God gave you emotions to prompt you to do things. Your emotions are prompts. They are cues and clues for your next move. So let's see what some of those are. I want to just read some of these verses over you. Proverbs, I'll start with Proverbs 16, 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. He who rules his spirit, his own spirit. You got to rule your own spirit, guys. Okay? Proverbs 18, 2. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his whole mind. Well, let me just tell you how I feel. I just, I know you'd want me to be honest with you and just tell you, you really hurt me. You really hurt me. And, and so, but I've forgiven you in Jesus' name because he requires me to. So I just want to let you know, I've forgiven you. I have had people do that to me. And, and if it was something I needed to own up to, you know, and, and you do need to say that you're sorry. And by the way, when you apologize, don't ever say I'm sorry if. There is never good fruit that comes from anything after if. Say, I'm sorry for. I'm sorry that I. Because there's always something that each one of us can apologize for when you're tangled up and can't get something solved. You, you, there's always, there's two chains involved in this entanglement, okay? So the fact that the Proverbs tell us literally that a fool is the one who's going to just reveal his own mind all the time. You're going to say everything you think. No filter. Ha, 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 sorry, I don't have any filter. That, that's going to get you in trouble so many times. So I love, I just love Proverbs 18. All right, Proverbs 25, 28. Like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. We have to be in control of our spirit. Guys, it's a fruit of the spirit, self-control. It's a fruit of the spirit. So, so you do realize that because of the way God set the world up on free will, you can actually take control of your life away from God. And he won't be in control. You'll be in control. Why did he set the world up that way? I would not have done that if I was him. But then we'd have a bunch of robots and, and no relationships, do you know? And so, so I'm thankful that he did. And when we show our love for him, it is extra sweet to him because we don't have to and he knows that we choose him but you must have control over your own spirit proverbs 26 excuse me 28 26 he who trusts in his own heart is a fool but he who walks wisely will be delivered i think you may have mentioned this one last week pastor jason um phenomenal message on deception and on making sure it's woven in with this one, but just making sure that everything we do is based on the word of God. It is our roadmap. 
okay? It's, it's your love letter. You cannot trust in your own heart. I wish you could. And as a prophetic person, if I'm not careful, I, I, there's times when I'm like, I'm feeling something really strongly. I got to get alone with God and find out if this is God or if this is Laura. I want to be so in sync with him that I have to ask that question. Do you know what I mean? Like it's never better or worse. It's always better or best. So, so I'm glad I'm, I'm glad Laura's close, but I don't want to live a life of close. I don't want to live a life of good. I want to live a life of best. And so when I'm making decisions, I, I, I can't ever go with just, well, yeah, that feels right. Unless I am really walking in the spirit or on a fast or, you know, have been in prayer or something like that or have some wisdom and experience in this area. Uh, but yeah, cannot ever just trust your heart. There's never good fruit that comes from that because you can deceive yourself. Philippians 2, 4, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. This is really my biggest argument for why God gave us feelings, okay? Matthew 22 is the, it shows us the greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart and love others. So if you ever have an emotion Something really emotional happens to you, and it is to prompt us to do something. If the greatest commandment is to love God and love others, that emotion is probably prompting you to do something for him or them. If it's anger, if it's frustration, if it's something negative that you're feeling at them or even at God, it's still a prompt for you to do something within the fruits of the Spirit and under the constraint of the Spirit with that person or in your relationship with God. There's times you want to just break it off. Like I wanted to just break those necklaces. And I was so glad I didn't give into that when I got them untangled. And I did get them untangled. But there's times you do. You're so tempted, you just break it off and think, well, this relationship is disposable anyway. It doesn't really, I've got this other group of friends now, and I don't really need them anyway, and I'm really tired of that behavior. And never once do you ever look at maybe the way they're viewing you. I mean, I want to say I'm sorry to you, if I, uh, any of you. If I was ever in your moment of crisis, jumped on your, put my knee in your chest and what? Yeah, I'm sorry if, I'm sorry that. Well, I don't know that I've done it with everybody. But it, that, that may be a part of your story with me. If that's a part of your story with me, I'm sorry if I wasn't tender enough. We have said in our house many times, the kids came to me for justice and to you for Band-Aids. Mom, they never said, Dad, he took my toy or whatever it was, you know. Our kids were three years apart, all of them, so there wasn't a lot of that infighting that you would have if you had kids back to back, back to back. Like, they didn't really have the same toys to share and that type of thing. But when something happened, it was always, Mom. But if they got a boo-boo, they would literally run to Chris. So he, he is, by nature, more tender than I am. And I think I've almost, you know, we fit into those roles and it serves a purpose, maybe. But I, yeah, but I am on a quest now to really better consider the feelings of others right in that moment. You know what I mean? Not just going to deal with the devil who's attacking you, but then turn around and minister to you. Our feelings and the feelings of others is what I'm saying are very important. And they might be... By expressing that dismay, showing you something about yourself that could be really beautiful if you add it to your life. So I've been giving this a lot of thought lately, and I want to go over to you, with you. Um, I'm going to skip the, uh, no, I'm not. Go to Hosea, pick up the Hosea verse, 11.8. This is a really interesting one. It says, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zebulim? Now, it finishes, my heart is turned over within me and my compassions are kindled. These, the people that he names here, the cities even that he names here, are so interesting. Ephraim, you know, was the, um, the rebellious, there was a son, there was the, the, 
the way that Ephraim had to be dealt with in Scripture is a picture of how God has to deal with us sometimes. The way God deals with Israel, the way he dealt with Israel, is oftentimes the way he has to deal with us. Give us a public spanking, you know? I don't know if you know what Adma and Zebulim are, but they were cities in Sodom and Gomorrah. And we saw what happened to them. What God is saying here is, it is breaking my heart to have to do this to you, but I have to destroy this. I have to, I have to teach you this lesson. I have to break you. Let me say that way. I have to break you. My heart is turned over with me. Have you ever felt that way? My compassions are kindled. I don't think I have it on here, but there's actually a, a verse in Lamentations. I want to say it's 120. Anyway, um, where Jeremiah is talking about um, his bowels are disturbed within him. You ever get upset and your stomach gets upset? Hmm? You know, Harvard said that the brain and the stomach should be one organ system. They are so connected. You get stage fright. You feel like you're going to throw up. When you really don't like somebody, maybe as a kid you said, I hate your guts, or you get a gut reaction. These, they're linked. It's called the gut-brain link. So for Jeremiah to say, for him to lament, my bowels are disturbed within me, my heart is breaking, it is a, sometimes in life you have deep, guttural, visceral reactions to things, and you should. But it should be to make sure that God's will is done, that God's word is accomplished in it. <clears throat> so let's just look in Scripture. I just put them all up here on one slide just so you could see them. I'm not going to read all of the verses. But just so you can know if God has emotions or not, there's plenty of places in Scripture that show us that he does. He experiences love. God feels love, hate, jealousy, joy, laughter. Take a picture of this if you want to and look these up later. He, and the scripture actually said God laughs. It says he laughs. Grief, compassion, these are things that he feels. God literally, do you ever feel those? Ah, you're made in his image. So it's super important. Your feelings are very important. They serve a purpose. What about Jesus? We can know God has feelings because Jesus sure had them, and he's the perfect imprint picture of God, right? So put those up there. Look at Jesus's. Temptation. He felt sadness, grief. He felt compassion. He felt sorrow. And most fascinatingly of all to me is that he felt rejection. He was despised and rejected by men. When he was on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I want to just throw this in there. There are many of you here who you love to pray. And you are a prophetic intercessor. You may say, well, I don't know that I'm a prophetic intercessor. Listen, if you go to this church one time or another, you're going to, you've, you've been in this environment so much that you're going to go, wow, I wonder if the Lord is trying to speak this to me. Maybe I need to pray about this. Boom, you're a prophetic intercessor. Because if you pray, if you're just a prayer warrior, okay, which is good, but you're praying a list. I have done lists in Roman numeral lists and five pages of, like it's a grocery list. And I have done that before. I've been that prayer before. But a prophetic intercessor says, Lord, what's on your mind? Or allows God to get your attention and interrupt your schedule. You're always saying, what does this mean, Lord? Hmm, maybe this means something. Maybe, my, maybe I'm late because there was a wreck on the way. I need to not be so upset. Hey, has that ever happened to you? And you get down the highway, and literally there is a massive pile up right there that could have been you. So many times this has happened to us. Remember the time we were on the trip home from somewhere this year, and we were, um, there was actually a massive fire in the middle of the interstate, and it happened two cars in front of us. And at the restaurant we had gone to, we got in the car right before this at the exit. We got in, we got in the car, and I said, wait. No, we weren't even in the car. We were on the sidewalk. And I said, wait, I'm going to go back in and get a spoon. And he's like, Laura. And I was like, just a second. 
And I come back out, we get in the car, and I'm telling you, we would have been the car right in front of it. Sometimes those things, like we talked about with the plane delay, sometimes those things happen, and an intercessor will say, wow, thank you, Lord. Now, why did you do that, and why did you leave me here this time? If that's you, you are a bundle of emotions. You are a feeler. You're a feeler. And sometimes there are people who think they are even manic depressive or bipolar, and they're just intercessors. I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had with people. They're like, what is wrong with me? And you can ask any of my children. There were times when my moods would change, and I would uh, whatever was going on at the moment, I assumed, you know, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's. There were moments I can remember them standing in my kitchen and I would be just going about business and this sadness would come on me. And I, I, I grew in my maturity of the Lord enough to go, he's fine, she's fine, they're fine, parents are fine. What's going on? Why am I sad? Most people, and maybe the me before, I had these understandings of the burden of the Lord and calls to prayer and how it interrupts your schedule, would just get on a phone call with a friend or they'd go eat something or let's turn on a movie and watch, you know, have a snack or go shopping or what can make me feel better or whatever, the things that you do to bring your flesh comfort. But a lot of times I would just disappear back into my room. I learned that if I went and got on my knees and prayed, the Lord would bring somebody to my mind and I would realize I, I was under the burden of the Lord for someone. They needed prayer. And I would pray and it would fly. It would lift. And I mean, it didn't take five minutes, just three, four minutes. And the Lord wanted some prayer for that person. The Lord wanted me to partner with him. Do you get this? He wanted to, he needed somebody to release on earth what this person needed in their life. And a lot of times, because I'm an encourager, I wanted to follow it up with a phone call or whatever. And that's what the burden of the Lord feels like sometimes. So no, you're probably not bipolar. There are some people who have chemical imbalances. I don't want to, I totally know that. And I know some of them. I know people who are on depression meds. I know people who are on anxiety meds. But if if you are wondering and you're in that place where you're like, you know, no, I just don't think I am, but why are my moods so crazy? Ask yourself, Lord, are you trying to interrupt my schedule? And are you using my emotions as a prompt? That's so often what the burden of the Lord feels like. Kids, you're in here today, the older kids, right? Are they in here? Maybe not. Maybe they went on back. Kids, they have emotions too. I mean, those little kids, you know, they don't want to do something mom or dad tells them to do. And you have to just make sure that you're speaking to them on their level. Their feelings matter too. So what I want to do today as we close, I just want you to remember that your feelings matter, others' feelings matter, but God's feelings matter. There's three sides to every story. Your side, their side, and God's side. And so I want to urge you to not be deceived by the things that you feel, but to test them. To test them with God's word. To always remember that if we move in love, then we are never going to fail someone. We're not. We must love others while we're speaking the truths of God over them. So I want you to stand up. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for your relationships. I want to, I want to just release over us a, a new spirit. It's just more of the Holy Spirit. But, I, you know, the, one of the fruits of the Spirit is love, is kindness, is gentleness. Pray this with me, if you will. Lord, I submit my emotions to you. I am made in your image. Thank you for my emotions. But I am not led by them. And they are not more important than someone else's. I love you. I love people. 
and I want to be your ambassador on this earth. So I just prophesy over you that where you work, where you live, where you shop, where you dine, where you play, where you rest, all of these places are full of opportunities for you to look at someone's countenance this week and say, how can I make a difference? How can I make sure this person feels seen and heard? How can I express to them God's love while also at the same time showing them that feelings, what they're feeling can be influenced by the evil one, that we do have an enemy, that all the chaos and evil that's going on in the world is not, it's not caused by God. There's obviously an enemy. And so, Father, give us the vocabulary to be able to set people free by speaking truth to them, by telling them, yes, the enemy's meddling in your life, but also seeing them first, loving them, holding them, not singing happy songs to a weary heart, but holding them, encouraging them. And then when we see that window open in their eyes, jump it in with truth. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that when we leave this place today, we are gonna be on the lookout for that. We want to be influencers for you. We are your ambassadors on this earth. And anything that you have ever done for me, Lord, the Lord, the, the love that you have given me, the forgiveness that you have given me, the encouragement that you have given to me, I vow to you this week, say this with me if you will, I vow to you this week I'm going to give it away because you've given me more than enough, more than enough, more than enough. Amen. Today, your ministry time, our ministry time, is going to be for you to minister to someone else here. I do not want you to leave here today, please. Uh, if you have to rush off to work or something, please text somebody before the evening is over and just talk to them. You know, I see you. I see your struggle. I know where you are. I love you. I'm sorry that I blah, 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 blah. Whatever it is, make sure you see each other. And you're really good at, at loving on each other. But just acknowledge uh, this week or today, even before you leave here, that you have relationships in this house that are worth building and worth nourishing. Are you all ready? That's your ministry assignment today. Find somebody who needs that, all right? God bless you. Thank you all.